that know me well know I like to fly by the seat of my pants, and so I like to scoot in at the nth hour. That's what I've done here today, too. Um, so I am Vanessa Graham, and I am uh, born and raised here in Baton Rouge. I did spend part of my life in Natchez, Mississippi, so I claim it home as well. Um, I'm an LSU grad, and many, many moons ago, and um, I have 14-year-old uh, twins. They're about to enter high school, and um, so I have started. I started my practice um, 10 years ago. Um, the Graham LLC. Uh, if I had known what it would be today, I would have named it something more interesting. But this is it. Um, there are 15 of us. We do outsource CFO work, uh, financial leadership services. And what that means is we're the outsourced financial leader to small businesses. And we're actually doing a lot of project work for very large businesses as well who have a CFO, controller, and full staff, but they need an extension of themselves. Like if they're going to do a deal or if they're going to, you know, launch into a new location or receive capital, anything like that. So we come in and, and um, you know, expand their bench, if you will, in, in times of need. Um, so anyway, enough about me. I Today we are going to talk about um, money moves is the name of our topic, making money move. And let me get kind of show of hands here. We got some business owners in the room. Okay, good, 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 good. Okay, and average years of business ballpark? 15, okay, wow. Three, okay. Ooh, okay, you, you stop me at any point if you'd like to take over the session. You may know more than me. <laughs> no, um, okay. Well, today, uh, would, would y'all call yourselves a financial experts in your area? Oh, right. one financial expert. Excellent. This is not, this is, I'm not going to be nervous. Okay. Financial expert? Okay. That's perfect. I like that answer. I like that answer. Okay. Uh, so today we're going to, we, you know, we have 45 minutes here, so we're just going to kind of cover some basics. And uh, what I want your takeaway to be today is uh, we're going to talk a lot about presentation of financial information. We're going to focus on the income statement. And, and in that, we're talking about presenting financials so that they read to yourself well, so that you can speak from them, and so that they speak to the audiences that you speak to, those being investors, bankers, fellow partners, whatever it may be. How to set those up and, and lead forward with your financial information, how you speak from that. We're also going to touch on dashboard data and key metrics. Those are a part of financial reporting and a very important part. And especially today and age, as things are more automated, you see the word dashboards come up with every application that you're involved with. And what do we do with that data? How do we present that data with our financials as well? All right, so please feel free to stop me, especially those of you that have been doing this for a long time. We will have Q&A after, but I'm happy to stop and go a different direction, okay? All right. This is weird for me not to see it from here and think about it up there. Okay. <laughs> um, couple, t couple takeaways. What I want you to remember is the takeaway for today. Again, we're going to talk about the financial statement, the presentation of the income statement. And when we talk about that presentation, what's important is that that presentation reflects your model. Each of you has in your business, your business has a particular model, meaning it is a transactional business, or it has recurring revenue, has a recurring revenue stream in it, or maybe it recognizes revenue on a completed contract method, such as construction or anything that has a fixed price contract in it, where you earn inside of the fixed price contract along the way. These are ways in which you earn revenue. These are revenue streams. They also have particular costs associated with them, and their models are different. You may, in fact, have a combination of all three or more. Does this speak to y'all in your businesses? Um, what type of revenue streams do you all have? Say it again. Federally funded. So do you have large fixed price contracts or within a scope? Okay. And you have people earning inside the contract. Okay, perfect. You? Oh, wow. Okay. 
seasoned, seasoned veteran over here. Okay. Um, so been through a lot of these then. Okay. Um, the other takeaway from today is, and I said this before, is when anytime you're presenting financials, there's no perfect way, but it should tell your story. And we are, we're going to see examples of that today. And the way I've gone about this speech and the way I like to do things is give you real life examples. And we're going to go through some real life examples of financial statements, how they've changed over time, how we in our business have changed them over time to tell that story and reflect that model so that you get kind of that, you know, what am I talking about? you know, conclusion to this. And then lastly, we are going to talk about metrics again. Metrics need to be operational information that goes alongside with that financial information. Okay, so this is a real simple example. We're going to talk about creating a model when we're just starting from scratch. This is a real simplified business model here. This is a, a landscaping business. This is many moons ago. This. Uh, a uh, client of ours came to us and was a and they were a, they were a young business and he had a very you know very simple business had a crew did landscaping work had a list of very good clients still does and one wanted to grow as all entrepreneurs do and so he said to to us i mean help me make sense of this financial information like well, can i do this can i get bank debt to do this like you know how do I see this in numbers uh, to grow? Can I do this? Can I afford this? So this model begins, if you think about it, do I have a do I have a pointer on here? I should have been the green. Oh, look at that. Y'all can see that? Okay. I have to point it up here. <laughs> okay. Let's see if I can see it. Oh, okay. I can't accept my contacts. Don't allow me to look that far. Okay. Let me do that. Okay. I think I'm loud enough to do this. Okay. I didn't wear the right shoes for this event today. Okay. That's all right. Okay. All right. Okay. So this is a very simple model, but this entity started with this revenue stream. Okay. So these were the existing customers and what they made month over month. Now, you see it, 95,000? And this says existing revenue. So this is their existing revenue stream. So list of clients, recurring revenue, because you know, it's a landscape business, recurring revenue. And this is what it was making, give or take. You know, we're doing a model here, so you know, it might have been plus or minus a few dollars you know, each month, okay? But the new, the way we went about this thought process is what can one crew do? So if this was three crews, if we take one crew and its revenue stream, what can one crew do? And he modeled out or explained to us that one crew could gen uh, one crew cost ten thousand dollars. This is the new crew, okay? This is the existing crew that services this revenue. So this is what his income statement looked like before. Okay, top line, 86000 Okay, so he made $9,000 on his a month on his existing crew, okay? A lot of expenses, right. We, we won't get into whether or not he was financially savvy or not. We just, this is, we're building out this crew. Okay, so he said this additional crew cost 10000 a month, okay? And the 10000 crew can generate 32700 a month in revenue when they're up and running, okay? And we backed into the buildup of how that would, you know, how we would get there, okay? So this is just a simple, just very simple way to look at it. But the takeaway here is that anytime you're, it can be a daunting task to build out your own forecast and model and budget, if you will, but th the best way to do that is break it down into something simple, like little, you know, little miniature businesses of yourself, basically. All right. That's right. That is right. So what would happen is in year two, 
This is where you're fully up and running, meaning this crew is cost 120 grand a year, 12 times 10. It's running at full capacity and it's making 32,700 a month. Correct. Correct. And in your case, I would, you could take, I would assume your contracts, you could break them down into yeah. high, medium, low. Okay. Just your portion. Correct. Yeah, so I would just take just your portion, and then I would take average contract size of X and what it takes to support that one contract, and then build it out. Oh, okay. A margin on it. Right. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Right. And so at some point you, you drop to the bottom line once you've crossed over a certain level. Mm hmm Right. Okay, good. Okay, uh, I'm reiterating what I've talked about before here. Okay, so we're gonna go through another example. Typical, uh, tell me the appli business applications you all are using. QuickBooks, QuickBooks, I'm sorry? CPA. CPA, that's your application? Oh, you're using the CPA, whatever they're using. Got it, okay, well, okay, so my point will be the same in that whatever is sent to you is whatever is that standard default pro uh, presentation, right? It's some default, it's not maybe the way you would like it, but it's however it comes out of the box, right? And so it, it may look something like this in alphabetical order if it comes out of QuickBooks, and it just comes out, right? And, it, and you can't make heads or tails of it, right? Because it just, <laughs> right? So, so this is, uh, this is an old client of ours a long time ago, and, but to my point about it needs to tell your story and show your model, this is a business that does uh, real estate sales. It does, uh, has some recurring repairs uh, software that it um, services, um, the, uh, repairs locations via its um, uh, online application, has recurring revenue. It has some uh, consulting type revenue earned by the hour person's time by the hour too. So it has different revenue streams, okay? And in the build out, uh, in the construction part of it, of course that would be fixed price contract where you're earning inside of the job. All right, so this is what this entity looked like before. And when you look at this, you say, uh, okay, you, your takeaways would be what? Well, what would be your first question as you look at this? You say what? Right. And do you question how it relates to which one of these revenue streams? These? Right. Right. 
Perfect. Right. You, so you always want to segregate your businesses between what's variable, what moves with the revenue, if you re bring your revenue down, which you could do away with, versus what moves with it versus what's fixed. Rent for, is a great example. It's fixed. Nothing you can do. I mean, short of renegotiating that contract that you can't do it. <laughs> $700,000, and so it feels like something that is less time or expense, uh, I guess, heavy. Right. So I would look at, like, man, I wonder if I should be scaling this and going bigger since it's just life insurance. Correct. Is, uh, that is exactly right. Exactly right. So this particular entity, at this certain phase in its business, okay, which is important, looked like this at the end. Okay, so this is what you just saw on this side. This is the same numbers shown over here. So this is by revenue stream. These are the labor dollars associated with those revenue streams. Here, and now this, in, this is a matter of choice. This particular entity, I don't necessarily agree with this, but this particular CEO wanted to hold each group accountable for their portion of the fixed expenses. So each, per, each department, if you will, got an allocation of the overhead. Now, I like to see all the overhead, the fixed expenses that you can't do anything about or it's hard to do something about all in one area. See, so here's some leftover overhead that couldn't go to anybody. It's probably the owner's expenses, right? But I would like to see all of it here and see if all my divisions make a total profit to cover that. And as you can tell, the problem here is that this, this group it needs to be carried by the others. Right. Right. And then it feeds into the problem of if I'm head of this business unit right here, then I might say, well, if I don't want to get rid of this, and the owner says, well, I don't want to move out of my building. Right? So it brings up a conversation that some, you know, you may not want to have. So that's a matter of choice. But the point here is you can see deeper into your business. You can make a decision. And it is easier to forecast off of this. Because to you, oh, I didn't mean to point at you. Oh, gross margin. Okay, so pro a couple of terminology here. Gross profit, which you'll hear of, is just simply revenue minus expenses, and the margin is simply that divided by the revenue. Like the yeah, gross profit margin percentage. Yeah. So, um, so notice these are the, it's the same entity, right? We took out interest and depreciation because you don't need that's mess that you just don't need to put in here. That's not going to change a financial decision. And so point being, you can jump off of this. Now, you mentioned the license revenue. There's a lot to be done there. There's a lot of opportunity here. So the question is, how far can they keep building this top line revenue with this same staff, right? Because if they can, then they drop that margin over and over until that group can't take it anymore, and then they've got to add to that group. So in this particular entity, the property sales were, the real estate sales, I think were in the services. Right. Now, the, this was repairs and maintenance. They repaired and maintained facilities, and they had those contracts. And then they did some consulting work around, and they were in a very particular industry where they, were aligned with financial institutions. So they only did financial institutions. So bank branches and things like that. Let's see. Okay. This, just in, I just pulled out of my inventory of this is another uh, business to, I'm not showing you the change. This is what we changed it to. It looked similar to that other uh, income statement when it first came out, quote, out of the box. Um, this is QuickBooks again. This is a equipment rental business. This business has different service lines within equipment rental, roll-offs, um, porta-potties, 
and dumpsters. That's the same as a roll off. Um, there was one other one. I've forgotten what the third one is, but big, big um, piece of equipment that when delivered contribute recurring revenue once delivered. This guy is what I would call an equipment junkie. While he made a ton of money, he made good money. He, this is the gross profit, so this is before overhead, okay? He turned around and bought equipment all the time. So, you know, an equipment is expensive. And so the, the uh, loss, if you will, in this business was on a cash basis because you don't see the purchase of equipment in the income statement. That's in your balance sheet. It's in your cash flow. You don't put your purchase of equipment. That expense doesn't go in an income statement. That is a capital purchase. That capital purchase goes in your balance sheet. It comes out of cash or out of debt. So that is all balance sheet related. You're not going to see it on your income statement. So this owner would turn around and, and while it was rent and equipment, it would get interested in new contracts and interested in new opportunities and go buy the equipment for it instead of focusing on the turnover of its own fleet and turning over that fleet and keep making this recurring revenue off of that fleet. You can see where it would win big contracts. You see this jump? And you see this jump? In theory, you would see that change, which here you do see, go straight to the bottom line. However, if you saw the cash in this business, if you were to see the balance sheet, you would see no cash and a lot of debt and a lot of equipment. Because in the winning this contract, he turned around and bought a bunch of equipment. And this comes from not managing the inventory. Um, so it's a, you know, could be a very good business, obviously. So we chose to separate this income statement in these particular areas. And you could argue that, okay, I want to see all direct costs be inclusive of fuel, be inclusive of maintenance cost and labor. That is true, but we broke it down like this because certain lines were taking more of the maintenance, more of the labor than were it, you know, it, wasn't, it wasn't even across the lines. Fuel prices are very volatile, as you know, and um, they actually had the ability to fuel the equipment on site as it came through the yard. So opportunity for uh, theft. Um, and it, uh, they also had to go to the landfill anytime. So management of the landfill costs was huge in this business. So you want to see those items. Uh, out by themselves, I don't know where the landfill is in here. Might be in, uh, oh, fees. This is the landfill. Okay, so notice how big the landfill costs are. You see them jump. So this is, you gotta manage that, that line item. So to see it all by itself was very important because if the crew was going to the landfill every day because it's convenient or they just wanna hang out because they don't wanna, you know, don't wanna go make the next rotation to pick up equipment, this is where a lot of your expense can go. It's also where a lot of your regulatory expense comes from. So point to this is that this income statement was broken down like this in order to have those particular risks jump off the page and to make a decision around them. Because in theory, these should all be pretty consistent as a percentage of revenue. These expenses, these are the, this is taking this total expense number divided by this revenue or whichever revenue stream it relates to. All right. So this is one of my more favorite. I love the tech industry. I've worked for a long time in the tech industry, and so I know that industry well, and I like it. So this is, um, this is a tech company. This is how its income statement was presented to us when it began. Typical software company that installs software, gets a recurring revenue stream after that installation and turns around and customizes that software as well, earns that, that revenue by the hour as it does that, contra that contractual work. A uh, couple issues with this. When I see an income statement like this, because it's all so over the board, like take the word recurring, recurring should build. 
No, it shouldn't go backwards like this, right? This is saying to me, this is probably on a cash basis, meaning they're recording, this is just revenue. We're just looking at the revenue side, okay? They're recording that revenue when they receive it, not when they earn it. So earned is I delivered, whether I put the people on it or whether I install the, the work, doesn't mean I sent an invoice and it doesn't mean I've collected. It means I earned it and I'm gonna, I'm gonna bill it and I'm gonna collect it. That's accrual-based accounting for those that don't know the difference in cash and accrual. Yes, oh, ten. oh I gotta move, okay, very quick. Um, this, um, this, um, so this statement tells me this is on a cash basis and needed to be cleaned up. We clean this thing up, we put operational metrics with it. So notice this, this uh, when you break this down, this is what that same income statement looks like. It had 47 customers, it resells through a reseller, so those receive a different margin and that's why we segregated them. These are the installs month over month. They sell, they sell and install six new systems a month. Those six systems should contribute growing recurring revenue every month as each one gets installed and builds on top of the previous month's revenue. And those installed clients should contribute more customizations every month, which are one and done. Okay, and that's an example of how you tie operational metrics with your financials so that they make sense and change the format so it reads deep. This is real easy to forecast off of now, now that it's in this format. All right, we're gonna skip quickly to, how many more minutes do I have? Five? Eight, okay, I'll be real quick. Three minutes then we'll go to questions. Okay, this is an interesting business. This is a rental business that, that, um, creates, buys raw product, puts the product together, and rents it. Kind of like Rent the Runway, something similar to that, okay? I'm not gonna tell you who it is, because it's a, you'll, you would know who it is. But um, this, oop. Oh, oop. oh shoot. Oh no! No! Well, shoot. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not good at the, at the technical part of the job. You talk about the services? Right. Right. To hire the person, you mean? So what you would you would want to do that contractually, right? Because you want the higher level skill set that you can't afford on a full time basis. And so you want that contractually so that you're only paying what you'd pay, say, a bookkeeper, but you'd get that skill set on a very partial. Like, we have clients that we only work with eight hours a month, right? And we have someone working 120 hours a month, depending on their size and their need, right? But that, the idea is that the cost to them is no different than they, if they paid for somebody to work for them that they can't use because their skill set is not high enough. Not necessarily. It really depends on your need. Like it, it they, we, you know, it may be. And like you see them on different scales, and I'm like, you want what's best, but you also right. And really, if it's set up right, it should be very efficient, right? So it may just be set it up, fix up the record so that it's easy to print and go and review together on a go forward basis, you know. Versus, there's a lot of people that ask for services like this, but they have a mess and it needs to be fixed first before it can run smoothly. And that's 
the challenge. And you can do that or we can do, you know, but you can work all that out before you enter into something like that. Okay, I'm down and out. But, uh, so I'll just try and say verbally what I was going to show you. We had the, you saw a bunch of numbers on the page. It was a rental, it's a rental business. We're still working with them. And they, uh, again, we should see the inventory turn over and over. They are making a profit, but spending all of their cash rebuying the raw materials. So the question, the business question is, where is it going? Because it's, we're spending our profit rebuying the material. And at some point, it should, it, you should have the inventory and it should turn. Give or take some scrap, but you, you know, you got to fix or whatever. In addition, that particular entity, one of the metrics that I was going to show you that we put up on the board was they would, uh, they would sell, we said, hey, we need to look at your average ticket price. So let's think about rent the runway. You go online, you, you, know, you buy your, your, your item for your ball or whatever, and you, your ticket price is maybe $500. And you bought two dresses for $500. And you rented, that was your rental. Well, for some reason in this business, what we're finding is that when the revenue comes out and the transaction is done, the customer has paid and the transaction has been earned and delivered, the average ticket price was much smaller. So something is happening. And because we watch this over time, we're like something is happening. What's happening is the person is changing the order. They're like, oh, I think I wanted two dresses. Nope. Mm. Let me go back. Let me remove one from my cart and I finish in with they got all excited and made plans around 500 a ticket, and it's really 250 a ticket when all said and done. Because they allow the customer to change the order after it's been submitted. So those metrics relayed that, brought that forward, and they're addressing that at this time. And that's what that was really going to look like. But anyway, so five more minutes. Any questions? Yeah.